Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for our latest update across the board. Um, due to a non-COVID related family emergency, Dr. Box will not be with us today. Uh, we'll keep her in our thoughts and prayers. Again, it's a non-COVID family emergency that she's tending to, but in her place, filling in for her is Dr. Dan Rasiniak. And Dr. Dan, you want to give us the latest sure. uh, numbers on the ground? Sure. Thanks, Governor. So today we reported 963 new cases of COVID-19 in the state. And this is the single largest number of positives that we've had in any one day. Now, the majority of these cases are related uh, to an outbreak of COVID in Cass County at a Tyson meatpacking plant. And we know about these because with our strike teams, when we hear about potential outbreaks, we have the ability, as we did here, to go and test everyone uh, in that facility. Um, I, again, I think a lot of that is because of our ability to rapidly mobilize teams and put them in place and get all the folks who are involved tested. We've also confirmed an additional 31 deaths, which brings our total to 844 as the total number of Hoosiers who have lost their lives to this disease. An additional 88 Hoosiers have died that are considered probable cases. Now, these are cases where a physician has made the diagnosis, but the test was not uh, done. So overall, this number brings us up to 15,961 as the number of Hoosiers who have had COVID-19, and that represents about 19% of all of those that we have tested to date. I also want to go over briefly the daily uh, updates on our ICU bed availability. You'll see that this is held fairly steady and we are still at about 44% of ICU uh, beds that are available and also our ventilator availability. I, I do want to highlight that number of close to 80% of ventilator availability is both a combination of the ability of our hospitals to uh, create uh, new uh, abilities and capabilities with ventilators, and also likely reflects that we're seeing a decreased number of critically ill patients with COVID-19. Also, just briefly, our weekly updates around race and ethnicity. Uh, you'll see here the number of uh, new cases that have been identified. I'll give you a second look through and you'll notice that the trends uh, are fairly steady. Also, the number of deaths, uh, those trends as well, based on race and ethnicity, uh, are fairly consistent to what we've reported. I'll give just a, a quick update on the study we announced last week in partnership with the IU Fairbanks School of Public Health. Uh, the plan was for 5,000 Hoosiers to be tested, and to date, uh, we have already had 2,850 folks who have registered uh, to be tested. We began over the weekend and will continue on this first wave throughout this upcoming week. And this is an important part for us to better understand how this virus spreads in our communities. And so, we're just asking that if you are asked to participate uh, in this or a future phase that you please do so. And you may be contacted on a postcard, through text, or even a phone call. So um, for us to get the most uh, representative and valuable information, we really need everyone uh, to participate who's asked. So thank you. I'm going to take a, a couple minutes to talk about the spread of COVID-19 in our long-term care facilities. So to date, nearly one-third of the folks in the state who have died were residents in long-term care facilities, which again illustrates the incredible vulnerability of uh, our elderly community and the congregate nature of uh, long-term care facilities. And this is why we continue to work with our strike teams uh, and our nurse surveyors to go out and test so that we can identify outbreaks as early as possible and to continue to partner with our long-term care uh, community to try to mitigate outbreaks as they occur. Now, later today, we will be adding to our uh, webpage uh, the aggregate data for long-term care facilities. So these totals uh, will be collected every Friday and posted the following Monday. 
So just to go through those, as of April 24th, 1,467 residents of long-term care facilities have tested positive for COVID-19. Unfortunately, we've also seen the number of residents who have died rise to 260. And those deaths have been reported in 85 facilities across the state. Now, we will be listing the aggregate number of facilities and the number of residents who have tested positive. We are not at this time providing a separate breakdown for staff. Um, that's because as we began reviewing the data, we realized that there are some staff who work at multiple facilities and that could result in us counting somebody twice. So we want to make sure that the data we're reporting is as accurate as it can be. And so we will continue to work on cleaning up the data and looking at it uh, and we'll add information as it's verified and becomes available. Lastly, I know how important it is for folks and how the interest around knowing what's going on in a long-term care facility, particularly for people who have a loved one that lives or resides there. And that's why we have worked closely with the state's uh, long-term care ombudsman and the long-term care associations to develop very specific guidelines for when and how facilities will communicate their COVID status with residents and their designated representatives. So this guidance will be posted on our webpage uh, later today at www.coronavirus.in.gov. And specifically, it's going to require that facilities designate a staff uh, to provide communication and that this will occur daily. And it's to inform both the residents and their designated representatives of the total number of COVID-19 cases and deaths as well as actions that they've taken to prevent the spread of this illness. And by implementing this requirement, we are taking steps that exceed what the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare uh, service is planning. Now, we believe it's the individual facilities that are best positioned to know what's going on in their location and to communicate that uh, to residents and their loved ones. This has been a very collaborative process with a lot of thought and a lot of input. And we recognize that it's a new approach and that it's gonna take some time to implement. But I do wanna uh, emphasize how important this is. Uh, we firmly believe that every resident and their designated representative has the right to know what's going on in their facility and that if families do not feel like they are getting uh, this communication, we have laid out a way that they can reach out to us they can do so through an email, family outreach, one word, at isdh.in.gov. And when we get these, this will allow us to look into the matter and investigate them. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dan. We also have some high flying news uh, that the Adjutant General Dale Lyles will give us a brief update on that Hoosiers might want to pay attention to over the course of this week. General? Thank you, Governor. This week, the Indiana National Guard will be conducting flyovers in Fort Wayne and Indianapolis. This is our state's opportunity to recognize the dedication of our frontline responders and to thank them for their unwavering support as they work to mitigate the COVID-19 virus. These flyovers are incorporated within our pre-planned and scheduled training missions. These missions aid in the training of our pilots to meet time on target and increase crew proficiency. The A-10 Warthogs stationed at the 122nd Fighter Wing in Fort Wayne, Indiana, will support a flyover in Fort Wayne tomorrow between 11.10 and 11.15 a.m. And an Indianapolis flyover will be on Thursday, April the 30th, between 10.45 and 11.05 a.m. There may be a variance of a few minutes on either side of those times. The A-10 should be visible to anyone within three miles of the flight path. For more information, please visit the Indiana Guardsmen Facebook page or other social media platforms. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, General. Uh, Dr. Sullivan, a lot has changed in a lot of people's lives over the course of the last two months. You've certainly um, dealt with a lot of challenges, but you also have a lot of um, optimism and some good that has come out of all this and the way that we're connecting and staying connected with one another. You want to give us, you have a lot you've been working on, so you want to share as much of that as you can possibly squeeze in today and then we'll have you back. Absolutely. Thank you, Governor Holcomb. 
Indiana can always count on her people to do their best and step up to help each other and themselves. Now Hoosiers are doing just that like never before and in heroic proportions. In these circumstances where we have asked people to stay home, to do business differently or not at all, we as a state have to provide support to them differently as well. The Family and Social Services Administration, or FSSA, delivers health care and social services to about one in five Hoosiers during normal times. And we knew that number would increase potentially dramatically during this pandemic. And in fact, it has. Since the week ending 315 of 20, applications for all programs are 75% higher. SNAP applications are 253% higher. TANF applications are 209% higher. And health coverage applications are 10% higher. So we've taken a number of steps to help ensure continuity of benefits as we work to meet unmet and emerging needs. In addition, we need to specifically address individuals and groups who are often unseen, those with disabilities, minorities, those with unmet needs like food insecurity and homelessness, our aging population, and those with mental health conditions. Today, I'd like to highlight just a few of the ways that Indiana has come together to better serve you. I must say that we have learned so much from this about what is possible, and we will never be the same as an agency. First of all, I'd like to talk about our safe recovery sites. 12 sites around the state are open or opening soon in partnership with local experts and public health to assist individuals who are recovering from COVID and experiencing homelessness or at risk for homelessness. These sites dem demonstrate the generosity of spirit of Hoosiers and are also a best practice in tackling isolation and quarantine for those who need support. The safe site here in central Indiana has cared for over 200 individuals already and has been instrumental in keeping homeless shelters safe and open. Next, I'll talk about Operation Food. Food insecurity was unfortunately already a widespread unmet social need in Indiana pre-pandemic. Because of this, an early and ongoing project for our teams was to produce a map that shows in real time where Hoosiers can find food near them. We are fortunate that our partnership with the Indiana National Guard has allowed for many food banks to continue to distribute food to food pantries across Indiana. Despite that, we have more work to do and will continue to partner across the public and private sector to supply food to critical populations across Indiana. Right now, the best way to help is through financial donations to your local food bank. With the Department of Homeland Security, we applied for one month's worth of FEMA shelf stable meals. Beginning this week, Indiana's 12 charitable food banks, a large community kitchen, and the Salvation Army of Marion County will begin receiving a weekly shipment of 125,000 FEMA meals. These meals will help meet the needs of significant additional demand in response to COVID-19. Next is advancements in Medicaid, SNAP, which is Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, and TANF, which is Temporary Cash Assistance for Needy Families. FSSA oversees multiple benefit programs. Medicaid, SNAP, TANF, and CCDF, which is the Child Care Development Fund, are the biggest ones. These programs help Hoosiers stay healthy, feed their families, and afford child care. In all Medicaid programs, cost sharing is suspended. This includes the Healthy Indiana Plan and the Children's Health Insurance Plan. This means there are no co-payments at the doctor, and premiums and power account contributions are waived for the months of March through August of 2020. Health coverage, SNAP, TANF, and CCDF benefits are all safe and will not be discontinued during the public health emergency. This month, many Hoosier families have started receiving more SNAP benefits as all eligible families are now receiving the maximum for their household size. I'm particularly excited about two new programs coming in May for SNAP. The first is SNAP Pandemic EBT, which is the electronic benefits card or a debit card. The USDA Food and Nutrition Service recently granted Indiana the authority to issue pandemic EBT benefits to Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program and non-SNAP households with one or more children who have temporarily lost access to free or reduced price meals at school due to COVID-19 school closures. For households receiving SNAP benefits, the additional benefits will be added to their existing EBT cards. 
Households not currently receiving SNAP benefits will receive a new pandemic EBT card in the mail with benefits automatically added. You don't have to do anything to receive these new benefits. The second is SNAP delivery where SNAP recipients will be able to use delivery services to have food come to their homes, allowing individuals who are high risk or have barriers like transportation access to safely receive their food. We have already authorized curbside pickup for SNAP, and this additional program is a welcome enhancement that will continue permanently after the public health emergency. Next is telehealth and telepsych. We also know that while regular operations of physical and mental health are disrupted, people still need to access health care. To support this, we bolstered access to mental health services along with non-emergent, non-pandemic medical care through the convenience and safety of telemedicine. The response to this among patients and caregivers has been tremendous. And this is one of the most important policy changes that we've been able to make. For your own safety and the safety of those around you, including your health care providers, we continue to strongly encourage you take advantage of ways to visit with your doctors over the phone or online whenever possible, but certainly not missing emergency services if you need them. It is my sincere hope to continue these practices permanently even after the pandemic. I'd also like to announce a very exciting partnership that developed out of our surge planning a virtual care network that is connecting Hoosiers with COVID or suspected COVID with home-based health services supervised by the physicians and healthcare teams of our federally qualified health centers and community health centers. These referrals began last week in three pilot sites that were at high risk for health system surge. They allow individuals who can recover at home to do so safely with a little more assistance and monitoring virtually. Next, I'll talk about childcare. FSSA is working in partnership with many local and statewide groups to help child care stay open as critical resources to serve families on the front line and parents who continue to work. We recommend that families who need help finding or paying for child care call Brighter Futures Indiana at 800-299-1627 to speak to a referral specialist or their local child care resource and referral agency. You can find that local CRNR by calling again, 800-299-1627. Our child care finder tool on the Indiana FSSA website helps parents find child cares for their children and assess their quality. And it's just been updated to indicate which child cares are temporarily closed as a result of COVID-19. This should help parents identify which child cares are still available to take care of children. Direct service professionals and child care workers are in a high demand so FSSA is connecting job seekers to these programs through our new Hoosiers Serving Hoosiers program. Next, I'd like to talk about our two-on-one partnership. And I know you're excited about this, Governor, uh, Governor Holcomb. Mm -hmm. You may or may not be aware that in the last legislative session, one of Governor Holcomb's agenda items was the integration of Indiana 211 with FSSA. That was slated to start July 1st. <laughs> But in a pandemic, our partnership became even more important than ever. I'd like to highlight the incredible surge in calls to 211 and our collective prioritization to meet that need. Thank you to the communities who upload their data and resources to the 211 data, database. 211 database, keep it coming. We've spent uh, 220, second, 220 million seconds with Hoosiers uh, from all of our counties across Indiana in one month. Uh, just since we opened up this new front door. Thank you to the navigators who answer the phone with kindness and humility. And thank you to the leadership who have dropped the call wait times to below industry standards, even in a pandemic under these circumstances. 211 has truly become another front door to meeting unmet needs for Hoosiers, and it's here to stay. And last, but definitely not least, we've talked about mental health in these press conferences a few times. And the fact that so many of us are struggling with a wide variety of challenges we didn't know were coming. I'm proud to announce a new website that goes live today that was quickly curated by our Division of Mental Health and Addiction called BeWellIndiana.org. BeWellIndiana.org is a new tool for Hoosiers to find free expert mental health resources. It will help Hoosiers manage their own mental health throughout the COVID-19 crisis, including links to trusted news sources, tips for staying healthy and safe at home, and access to addiction recovery support. 
The site also offers a link to sif simple self-assessments offered by Mental Health America. The immediate results provide a quick snapshot of your mental health and will help Hoosiers determine if they could benefit from seeking professional mental health support. There's also a library of videos featuring real Indiana mental health professionals speaking right to you as Hoosiers about what we're all facing and feeling. The main points of almost all of these videos from the pros is that what you're feeling is common, it's okay, and there are things that you can do to help yourself as well as people in your families who might be struggling. As the pandemic situation changes, Be Well Indiana will adapt and shift focus to address the most compelling mental health issues at the time. So again, bewellindiana.org. I encourage you to check it out and share it and the information you will find there with family, friends, and colleagues. All this information and more, including FSSA guidance for various programs and stakeholders regarding, regarding COVID-19 can be found on our website, indiana.gov backslash FSSA. We update this information and additional changes and enhancements almost daily. Be safe and be well. Thank you, Governor Holcomb. Thank you, Jim. Incredibly proud. Um, as the general would say, job well done. And a lot more work ahead. A lot more work ahead. Yeah, but we're up to it. Um, I, last week, I, I thanked um, various doctors who were putting in double time and um, nurses and nurse aides and police and firefighter for all that they were doing um, carrying multiple shifts, multiple jobs to meet the demand. And um, someone dropped off some sweet things from a company called Sweet Things um, that are appropriate for many folks on this team. This is a teddy bear in scrubs. Dr. Dan, <laughs> sweeten up your day. This is, uh, I guess, turtles. I have not tried them, I promise. Turtles and masks. Uh, and some other uh, messages for our law enforcement, for the firefighters and, and uh, folks on the front lines, the first responders. And what we have done since last week and since Wendy saw that and, and created these sweet things, uh, we put together a video that I think better summarizes what I was trying to articulate um, last week. So check out this video if you would. COVID-19 is more deadly than the flu, and there is no cure. And Hoosiers are dying every day. But we know that most of the people who get this virus will be okay. Most of the people who get this will survive, but some will face severe illnesses. This is why we have taken all of these unusual and drastic steps. And why this period of our lives feels like nothing most of us has ever experienced. If you are still scared, let me offer this. Indiana is home to more than 16,000 licensed physicians, and I am one of them, and I am one of them. And I am one of them. And I am one of them. I'm Dr. Jen Sullivan, your Indiana Family and Social Services Administration Secretary, but I'm also an emergency room physician at Riley Hospital for Children and continue to work there every week. I am Dr. Dan Rosiniak, your Chief Medical Officer at the Indiana Family and Social Services Administration but I am also an emergency medicine physician at Eskenazi and continue to treat patients every week. I am Dr. Michael Kaufman, your state EMS medical director with the Indiana Department of Homeland Security. I'm also an emergency and EMS physician with Ascension St. Vincent and continue to work clinically overseeing our EMS, stat flight, and critical care transport programs. I am Dr. Lindsay Weaver, your Indiana State Department of Health chief medical officer. I'm also an emergency room physician at IU Health and continue to work at least one shift a week. As a physician, I will continue to show up. 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 We, the entire frontline team, will be there. If you need help, the doctors, nurses, paramedics, and other healthcare professionals across this nation are going to be waiting at the door to make sure that we do everything we can to help you. We may look intimidating under all of our protective gear, but we are normal people under the mass who are trying to do everything we can for you. Thank you to our colleagues who are fighting this pandemic every day. And thank you to Hoosiers who are hunkering down so we can come out stronger. Well, you may be normal people, but you are taking on abnormal challenges and uh, maybe ordinary people, but doing extraordinary things. And we are all one, and we are all showing up. 
um, in an effort to not just meet this challenge but overcome it. Uh, we've got an important week ahead of us. Um, obviously, every week, every day is, but we've made a lot of progress over the last seven, ten days. And for uh, what we'll address later in the Q&A portion of today, hope to get at some of that. But also, you should know that tomorrow we'll be giving some updates on some progress that we've made and plans that we have uh, on the testing front. Then on Wednesday, uh, we'll do the same on the tracing front, some plans that we have laid and will start to unfold. Uh, that will get us to the May 1st um, date where we'll address our executive order and where we go from here after this week statewide. So a lot going on, maybe under the surface, that folks don't see how much paddling is going on under, under the surface, uh, but some key days ahead that will help orient us and point us as we move forward. And with that, Rachel, we'll get right to the Q&A. Kurt Christian, the Indianapolis Business Journal. Sure. Good afternoon, Kurt. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Uh, I was hoping that you might address um, those impacts that you've seen from the eviction moratorium, uh, both on the tenant and landlord side since March, and how that's influenced your plans ahead of this uh, May 5 expiration for the moratorium. Well, it will factor in um, real time and the dates that we get to on May 1st. So this coming Friday is when we will edit uh, the executive order in terms of that hunker down order, in terms of everything else that's been included to date. Uh, but you should stand by and be ready on Friday when those details will be included. Jeff Smith. WLFI. And I should say before we get to Jeff that uh, Joe Heron's general counsel, that provision that he specifically cited uh, is in effect until the entirety of the emergency order, if I have that correct. Do you want to touch on that? Just to, and then we'll get to Jeff just to kind of button that down. Uh, good afternoon, Joe Herons, General Counsel to the Governor. So that provision on evictions and also on the moratorium on evictions and, and also on foreclosures is tied to the renewal date of the executive order that declared the emergency. So right now that runs through May 5th. And as the Governor said, uh, as we work through the week, any changes to that would be uh, talked about uh, as, we, as we come to it. Jeff Smith. Yes, Jeff, thank you. Uh, hi, Governor. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Very good. Um, on Friday, we were notified by the Logansport mayor that the Department of Corrections was taking some offenders uh, to the juvenile intake facility in Logansport. It, it, does that indicate a shift in your thinking about uh, inmates and the prison population in general? And a related question, we were also notified of a potential riot at Westville sometime last week. Could you address those questions? Uh, I could, but I see Rob Carter uh, at the podium here. You want to take both of those on? Hi, uh, Rob Carter, Department of Corrections. Uh, first, the uh, Logan Support issue, we have transferred about 40 offenders that are el er elderly, I have trouble saying that, uh, offenders to, to that location for their own safety. Uh, secondly, there was not a riot at Westville. Um, there has been some tension at a couple locations, but there was not a riot. Thank you, Jeff. Sherry with the Indianapolis Star. Good afternoon, Sherry. Good afternoon. I have a question for Dr. Rusniak based on uh, what he was just saying about the long-term care uh, facility staff. Last week, it was reported that 512 staff um, have fallen ill and one has died. Is there some question about the validity of those numbers given the way that you guys are looking at it? And also, are you reporting at all on other healthcare workers, medical, medical types, um, nurses, doctors, hospital types on their um, positive testing and deaths? Have you seen any, or do you know of what the numbers are for that population? Thanks for the question. Um, in terms of the numbers we previously reported, these are the numbers that we uh, receive from the long-term care facilities when we go out with our surveyors and, and 
One of the issues that we've discovered as we've gone through it is that there can be employees that work at multiple facilities. So I can't tell you with confidence that at 512 couldn't have involved some that work at more than one facility. Uh, obviously the death would be still would hold as one. That's part of what we're going to be doing as we look at the data that's come through uh, after the executive order from Dr. Box on April 10th is to make sure that we collect that data in a way that makes it um, the most reliable. Uh, in terms of other healthcare professionals, I don't have any uh, data or any information on positivity related to them. Jessica, W-E-H-T. Good afternoon, Jessica. Hi, Governor, good afternoon. It is. Uh, my question is, I know Indiana is working closely with neighboring states uh, to reopen on similar timelines, and yesterday, Governor Pritzker said that Illinois schools should be prepared for the possibility of distance learning even into the fall. Um, so my question is, is this something that Indiana is also, you know, considering or being prepared for, even though that's sort of a long ways off? Well, of course it is. Um, I mean, we're looking near term um, and long term. And come Friday, we'll kind of lay out our thinking in terms of stages. Uh, what will immediately take effect if the numbers hold up again? I want this look I, every time I talk to any of my neighboring governors. I always say um, It used to be in life. I wanted to be uh, the fastest and the first um, I want to be the surest and the safest in every step that we make and so when I say that we're talking with our neighboring states We are doing that we are collaborating, but this isn't a competition um, to be first this is if anything a competition to be the safest and the good news is with every governor that I talk to again multiple I'll be with many tonight um, um, we're sharing best practices and we're sharing what we're seeing together uh, and so in terms of whether it has to do with um, Indiana having had retail open curbside for some days now um, more than a week uh, and others starting to do that, or Indiana having construction that has occurred for um, weeks now, uh, and some other states are starting to do that. What we have proven, I believe, is that we can manage this. Uh, but if the numbers take a turn on us in any one area, we have the ability, that's why I always talk about lift and suppress and the balance uh, that has to occur going forward with anything that we lift or suppress. Schools fall into that category, just like retail, just like manufacturing, just like construction. Uh, as I mentioned last week, I said we're going to get to that decision probably closer to mid-May. Um, so we're not there yet. We've got some more time to see potentially some other things come online. Uh, but you can expect to hear from us on the um, education front, both pre-K through 12 and then um, higher ed as well, more in the middle of the month. And that's just right around the corner. Brandon Smith, Indiana Public Broadcasting. Afternoon, Brandon. Afternoon, Governor. Um, I want to ask about the Department of Correction. Um, you're now moving some patient or some offenders around uh, because of the risk of COVID-19. Uh, you have the numbers of cases going up uh, in some cases in, in a big way at, at various facilities. Has that changed your thinking in terms of letting some nonviolent folks who might be close to the end of their sentences out a little early? No, it hasn't. Rob, you want to talk about the reason why, as you, you did allude to uh, with the elderly, but uh, also that this is consistent with um, kind of our strike team approach and, and uh, making sure that we're addressing what's happening on the ground, regardless yeah. of the location. Thank you, Governor. Rob Carter again with Department of Correction. Every week, uh, we I talk to the Midwest directors and commissioners of uh, Department of Corrections around the uh, surrounding states, and everybody, uh, I think Illinois has released a few offenders, but most every state is in tune with us, and you know a lot of these offenders are uh, a vulnerable part of the population. They have no place to go, so it's not a one-size-fits-all with, uh, with those that are being released. So we have to be aware of that. And again, you know, um, do, you know, where do we put them at? You know, there are nursing homes that um, just won't accept an offender at this point in time. So 
there are, there are a lot of challenges with uh, just releasing offenders. It's not as easy as what it sounds. Richard Solomon, WTHI. Good afternoon, Richard. Thanks for joining us. Good afternoon, Governor. I have two questions. Uh, the first one is involving non-FDA approved rapid uh, testing funding. So in Terre Haute this weekend, there was an incident that involved the prosecutor's office, a group of so-called physicians out of Crawfordsville had a pop-up rapid testing tent charging folks $75 a test. Um, the prosecutor's office did shut this down and they say they weren't um, involved with the FDA, state, nor local health departments. So I wanted to hear your guys' response on this. And a lot of people were going up to this getting tested um, out of fear. So uh, the last question I have is what should people be checking prior to for legitimacy and making sure that this stuff is real? Sure. Um, so when we look at any medical test, uh, the importance of it is how it informs what we do. Um, the, the worst thing that we can have is a test that is invalid or that gives us false information. So if we're testing folks and finding out that it's either telling them that they're so-called immune uh, because they have uh, a detectable antibody and they're not, then we're putting them at harm. And so it's really important uh, when we look at testing now and as we move forward as additional c tests come forward is that we make sure that these are the FDA approved tests and more importantly that we know how to interpret those results and that that is almost always going to depend on having a clinician who takes care of you, who knows your history and your story, looking at that test and putting those two things together to make the best decision as to whether or not you're somebody who's had COVID-19, somebody who's not, and whether or not you should change uh, how you behave based on that. Kevin Rader, WTHR. Afternoon, Kevin. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Governor. Um, the situation in Cass County, I'm curious of how you're viewing what's going on there. And also, we've seen about, what, 3,000 new cases in the last few days. So I'm wondering what role that will all play when you decide about uh, relaxing uh, restrictions. Thank you. Yeah, um, Dr. Dan, you want to take that? But sure. I will tell you this, Kevin, just in general, um, as I've said, and I'll remain consistent, uh, throughout this whole process, we, we look at the whole state and we look at it region by region uh, and we let the numbers dictate what move we'll make next. We don't try to force anything. We don't try to take a shortcut. We don't assume anything. Um, we'll let the science and, and the medical experts uh, point out what we need to know, how to be informed about the decisions that we make before we make them. And Dr. Dan, you want to talk about sure. the totality of the tests and how that kind of is yeah. put in perspective? Yeah, I think um, in part what we're seeing uh, in Cass County is the result of having a uh, rapid strike team and targeted testing. And we know that we're going to see this because they're designed for us to find outbreaks early so that we get in, identify all the folks, and then able to appropriately isolate those folks so that we don't get more communal spread. So I think as we follow this uh, pandemic forward, we're going to see that there's going to be outbreaks in various areas. The key for us is that we're able to identify them. That's ultimately, I think, going to be tied to the success uh, of what we do moving forward is that we identify cases early, uh, we figure out those who have uh, COVID-19, and we're able to appropriately isolate them both from the workforce and also from the larger community. And this, this will be a part of, Kevin, how we manage this long term. This is not a virus that's going to go away in three weeks or according to our staged timeline. That staged timeline contemplates how we manage, how we keep that curve flat, how we slow that spread. And that requires, by the way, when we do um, find those positive cases, it requires, it's incumbent upon that individual to self-isolate. That's how we will slow the spread. So it's not, that part of it's not rocket science. That part of it's discipline um, or um, brain surgery or any other analogy you want to make. But it requires, that's why when we say we're all in this together, that's that relationship. And that's to date why we've seen around the state of Indiana, um, some places haven't flared up or, or spun out of control. Where they do, we will surge ourselves. And that's where those strike teams come in. Nikki Kelly, the Fort Wayne Journal-Gazette. Afternoon, Nikki. Hello, Governor. 
I have kind of a two point, a uh, two part question on funds that are coming into Indiana. The first is whether you guys have identified how much money you will pass on to local governments to help with their amounts and kind of how that process will be. Sure. And the second is I understand FSSA, uh, I guess, sought some additional funding for Medicaid, but the state budget agency turned down their request. So I wanted to check on the status of that. Well, do I have the guy for you? Uh, he spent four hours today talking about this and a lot of other things, but you want, you actually, you can take both parts of those or Dr. Sullivan, you can come in as well. If you Very choose. well. Uh, Chris Johnston from uh, OMB. And uh, so we are uh, taking a look at the uh, coronavirus relief fund uh, package. Uh, we're going to receive a sizable amount of, amount of money, uh, approximately $2.4 billion. And uh, as the governor mentioned, the recovery team spent at least four hours uh, talking about that today. Uh, there is going to be a, a package with uh, a, a local uh, impact uh, focus on it. The exact structure has not been finalized, but uh, spent a lot of time uh, looking at uh, how to uh, allocate those funds uh, with a local impact. As far as the impact on FSSA, uh, we continue to look at that. Uh, that's an interesting uh, proposition. They provide a lot of great uh, services uh, to the vulnerable populations. But that is a balancing act, and so we're taking a look at that as well, a very deliberate look. And the balancing act is that we have the immediate crisis that we need to take care of over the next several months, but it's also something that we need to be mindful of as the economy turns south and will probably uh, you know, be an impact over the next several years. What is the right sort of uh, assistance we can provide in the near term, but not overextend ourselves when the revenues uh, really uh, start to uh, decline over the uh, coming days? Thank you, Chris. Whitney Downard, CNHI. Good afternoon, Whitney. Good afternoon, Governor. I've got two questions for you. The first question on what are these positive indicators that we're seeing that would allow us to loosen restrictions? We're still getting record number of positive cases identified almost daily. And then my second question would be for Commissioner Payne. I was curious how much we've actually got left in our unemployment fund after you know, sure. awarding so many benefits and how he envisions, how long he envisions we are able to sustain that funding. Yeah, I'll buy Fred you some time here. Um, Whitney, what we're looking at, not just five. I mean, we've, we've talked about um, the nature of EMS runs. We've talked about a lot of things in the past, but kind of in general, what we're looking at are hospitalization rates. We're looking at our capacity to care in terms of ventilators available, in terms of ICU beds um, available. We're looking at death rates. We're looking at where in the state um, these rates are fluctuating. And we're looking at obviously our PPE inventory so that we can care for those um, who are in need. Then I would say the last item that was critical in my estimation has been what we spent all of last week and leading up to where we are today in terms of how businesses, given the opportunity to reopen safely, how they would be able to do that. So that's why we solicited that input from the industries, various industries themselves, because without that part, if we were just to think that we were just gonna go back to the way we used to do business, we just wouldn't be able to open in the environment in which we find ourselves in. So it's incumbent upon us um, in terms of our healthcare network um, to be able to properly uh, assess and determine if we can care for those who are in need. And again, I, what I talked about was hospitalization, admission rates, um, our capacity to care, et cetera, and then how we will do business. And then Fred, you want to take the second half sure. of the I trust fund. What you asked. Yes, the yeah. trust. Perfect. So right now we have a little bit under six hundred and fifty million dollars in our uh, trust fund for unemployment insurance. And one of the things that uh, we uh, we're not really worried a whole lot about is money being there to pay benefits. Uh, as you may recall. Uh, one of the things that we've been looking at over the past few years is how to increase and make sure that our unemployment insurance trust fund is solvent. We did pass some legislation over the past uh, legislative session that the governor signed into law uh, to help beef that up. Even though we didn't anticipate uh, this pandemic coming, we had put things in place to make sure 
that we were increasing the amount of funding that's in that uh, unemployment insurance trust fund. So we are looking at that every week. And if we need to, uh, we have access to federal dollars if our trust fund gets below a certain amount. Thank you, Fred. Leanne, The Daily Journal. Good afternoon, Leanne. Hi, I have kind of a two-pronged question. Um, first, it would be, what are your priorities for reopening? For example, why pet groomers first? And um, what about some larger type businesses like churches? For example, we saw a church sign that says they will reopen on May 2nd. Is that true? Um, and what are your sure goals for that yeah there are numerous factors that obviously or pieces that have to snap together there's no one size fits all but obviously um, understanding how this novel uh, coronavirus unfold or um, evolves and changes and mutates um, we have to make sure that the one thing that we are mindful of is the the density of it all and so that's why um, we haven't singled out, you mentioned churches, but we haven't singled out any one type of mass gathering, but we're very aware that that's where this can spread um, the fastest. And so obviously the factors on how we select one industry over the other, construction was able to um, conduct business in a very safe and responsible manner for some weeks now. And so very methodically as we layer in more business if it's responsible if it can be done safely then that's how we'll look at this we're not looking at picking winners or losers we're looking at who can do business in a safe way from a state perspective and that you know various things factor into that where you are in the state of indiana the numbers in southwestern indiana or northeastern indiana are very different than central indiana and we have to factor all those things in. So it's not specifically about one industry or another. It's about how that industry conducts business uh, and will conduct business in the future, that that's how we're making this determination. And that's how we're spreading out what comes back online if it's safe to do it. But I want to stress um, that if we start to bring things online and, and something flares up or starts to look like it's getting out of control, then we have to um, do everything we can to contain that and to slow the spread. Eric Berman, WIBC. Good afternoon, Eric. Afternoon, Governor. A um, couple of questions about uh, Cass County. Um, we're seeing Lake County size numbers there in a county that doesn't have Lake County's infrastructure. Are you? confident in the capacity of the hospitals if those people get sicker or if additional patients get sicker? Are we looking at prepositioning beds, as uh, General Lyle said last week, in Lake? And also going back to Kevin's question about, uh, about region, how this affects reopening, as you've said yourself, the virus doesn't know what a county line looks like. So yeah. if we do something regional, is it just Cass County? Does it extend to Carroll and Tipton? Are we looking at healthcare districts? How would, what would a regional plan look like? Well, we'll get to that Friday. Um, and you're right, it doesn't know, um, the virus doesn't know lines. Uh, Dr. Deborah Burks talked about county by county. We'll look at it regionally. It could mean the county. Um, but my point is, what's going on in Angola and what's going on in New Harmony may not be reflective of what's going on in Southport. And we have the ability to respond to that. You want to take the first question? Sure. So the work that we've been doing over the last six weeks for surge planning has been by region, by preparedness region. And I have been absolutely floored with the leadership that's happening at the hospital level for care sites to work together to share resources, space, and people so that they're ready to receive these types of surge numbers, even when they wouldn't on a normal day-to-day -day basis be able to accommodate them. We have not seen numbers move out of um, phase two, which is what we call um, our surge phase when you're still within the halls um, of the hospital itself and not moving out into different um, alternative care spaces. And that's because of the pre-planning that's been done at the regional level in partnership with hospital systems, 
with EMS and with Homeland Security to make that happen. That is the case in uh, Cass County and that region as well. And I should just say, Eric, you know, one of the things, and we were very clear about this before we kind of take these next steps, we wanted to make sure that, that our testing and our tracing programs in all confidence going forward had the ability to, to serve as our radars in terms of where we are and, and to be able to not look in a crystal ball, but to be able to kind of forecast out in terms of 14 days or 21 days where we will be. Angelica Robinson, Wayne TV. Good afternoon, Angelica. Good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> my question is, re is uh, in regards to the nursing homes. Um, several nursing homes across different states have asked for immunity from lawsuits amid this COVID-19 pandemic. Is that something that you have considered or what is your, what is your stance on that? Sure. Um, we uh, have been in discussion with them as well. Uh, we have put out guidance around just general um, liabilities pertaining to the response to COVID-19. Uh, we've not put out any specific guidance on uh, a blanket waiver or immunity for long-term care facilities as it pertains to their response. We have, uh, along the way with uh, CMS's guidance, changed how we work with them. And so although we still do our regulatory function, we use a lot of that workforce now more in partnership, and it's much more about going into facilities and helping them uh, to respond to outbreaks as they occur. Uh, but we have not removed uh, all liabilities from, from them. Cameron from WRTV. Afternoon, Cameron. Hi, Governor. Good afternoon. Uh, a question for you and a question for Commissioner Payne. Um, you've previous, previously said that um, businesses need to start preparing their plans for what they should do when we eventually do open up. So can you maybe give a preview of some of the things that you may recommend that businesses start looking into? Like, should we be looking at getting a PPE for all employees or buying thermometers, those kind of things that maybe people want to start pricing? And then for Commissioner Payne, um, I, I, can you give us an update on how we're doing with the system on getting uh, gig workers, Uber drivers, barbers into the system and when that'll be online? You wanna go and then I'll. Sure. So our uh, PUA, the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance uh, Program, we started accepting applications on this past Friday and we received over about 65,000 uh, new applications. Now, some of those uh, were duplicative of the individuals who had already applied under our old system and that information got carried over. And payments should start rolling out sometime around uh, in the week of May 8th. Yeah, and Cameron, um, I would just say that uh, there are, there's a long list of things um, that every business, I would recommend, and industry should be doing right now anyway. Many of them are. I've been so impressed by the number of companies who are, some are calling daily their employees who are at home, not just checking up on them, but they're teleworking from home, or they're planning for the day when they do come back, or they're, they've, some have set up exercise routines where they're doing um, exercise programs on Zoom together as a company. So there is some uh, direct connections that have, um, that have stayed intact from day one, going back a couple months. Um, also, so that, that communication, vitally important right now, that education about how things will be different when you do come back. There are some companies that the first couple days, they've told me the first couple days back at the work site will be only about how the world has changed, about what's different in the environment, about how they will have to uh, make changes and adjustments to be safe for each other's sake and for the consumer's sake as well. And so I would be recommending that communication start to, um, not just start, but should have been ongoing for quite some time. Um, yes, also about PPE, the Dental Association has posted their own guidelines. This was one of the reasons why we reached out to every industry. We've got some thoughts on this too, and we'll uh, elaborate on all of those on Friday. Um, just of, as we have in the past in terms of how you will conduct business today. 
Um, but of course, the Dental Association has guidelines that they've practiced that are according to the CDC, adhering to the CDC guidelines, and then what we've put out as well. And so, making sure that you can operate safely um, when that day comes, it may it it may be next week, it may be four weeks from now, uh, it may be after that. But in the meantime, don't. That's what I said last week. Don't squander this time to be ready to go when it's safe to go. Our final question is from Justin, the Westville Indicator. Hello, Justin. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Governor. The number of confirmed cases across the state of Indiana has grown 37% since last Monday. The number of confirmed cases in Westville Correctional Facility has grown 12% over the same period, despite being in closer quarters. Sources within the Westville prison say there are numerous untested cases of COVID-19 across the inmate population. How can the growth of the virus in the prison be one third of the growth across the general public when numerous other facilities where individuals are in close quarters, such as nursing homes and prisons in other states, see more significant rates of infection? And why won't the Department of Corrections disclose the total number of tests conducted? And why hasn't it tested the entire inmate population at the site of the state's largest incarcerated COVID-19 outbreak? I think Dr. Doss, you've got an answer for him. I do. <laughs> Kristen Doss, Chief um, medical officer for Indiana Department of Correction. And thank you for the question, Justin. Um, so you're right, in an ideal world, we would test everyone everywhere, including within our facilities. However, due to the increasing yet limited number of resources, um, we are testing in a target manner, which is in line with CDC guidance and recommendations from the Indiana State Department of Health. Additionally, the test is more valid and accurate when symptoms are actually present. So testing an entire facility, testing 3,500 offenders, just is not the best use of resources. Um, and we, and we you know, see that within DOC, just like in the community. We're gonna test those who have symptoms. To be completely transparent, which is what you know, we're all here to do, um, we are in touch with health authorities in the region. So Commissioner Carter and I just had a call this past weekend with neighboring um, states and commissioners and their health authorities just to kind of see what numbers are looking like and to compare notes. Um, we do know that numbers in congregate settings are gonna be much higher than they are in the general public. Um, but we are learning those lessons from um, other jurisdictions about how best to proceed and lessons that they've learned. What I can tell you, Justin, is that 80% of folks who we have tested within our system have had either no symptoms or very mild symptoms. 15% have gone to the hospital and less than 5% have uh, required ICU care. And then finally, Justin, what are we doing? So what the um, Department of Correction is doing is we are following CDC guidelines, um, and specifically the guidelines in regards to correctional facilities. So those guidelines were published almost a month after we released our um, plan, but when they did come out, you know, our plan, pandemic plan has been in line with them and we continue to update things as we go. Additionally, we are testing areas, like I said, that do have symptoms, um, and our numbers are a reflection of the work that we are doing in partnership with the State Department of Health. So we're seeing more positives because we're doing more testing. So as we do more testing, I do expect to see um, numbers increase. And then finally, another thing that we're doing is isolating those who do have symptoms and quarantining those who have been exposed. Thanks again, Justin. Thank you for joining today's briefing. Governor Holcomb 